Um, and I'm delighted today uh, to be uh, introducing someone who uh, is, to me, just a, a real superstar in our specialty. And um, so uh, Dominda is uh, at University of Toronto at St. Michael's Hospital. Um, to, to go through his whole bio would take half the time. He's published over 250 peer-reviewed articles. He's a real leader in the space of perioperative medicine. He's uh, and in particular, he's led and been a part of some of the biggest uh, prospective trials looking at cardiac biomarkers. And if you really look into the space of troponin, BNP, and a lot of the things that we've wrestled through at Vanderbilt of how do we apply, apply this practically, um, he is just a phenomenal leader uh, in that space. And so I was delighted uh, when he agreed to uh, to join us for this. Um, and this is also a reminder, I make a plug every time, uh, that as far as, and I have to be careful here now that we have uh, a colleague from uh, from Canada, but in the in the United States, these are ones uh, that we have as far as a fellowship goes, and they have fellowships in Canada as well um, that could be spoken of today. But just to put out there as we continue to try to expand this idea of um, from the anesthesia perspective, being involved with perioperative medicine, uh, something for you to think about. So with that, I am going to uh, stop my share and uh, and turn things over. And uh, I'm excited for this talk and really to uh, to hear y'all's questions as well. Everyone knows we we try to practically follow particularly the Canadian guidelines since they're the latest ones really out there on uh, at least this side of the ocean. And so super excited to uh, to learn today. So Domina, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, my pleasure. And just, just to confirm, you can see my slides, yep? Correct. Excellent. So first, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join, present, and speak at the seminar series. And, and as I mentioned to Jennifer at the start, a major kudos to you and your colleagues for organizing this and creating a sort of an avenue for people interested in the space of perioperative medicine to hear from speakers uh, and experts across a range of areas. I mean, from nutrition to cardiac biomarkers to AKI. So the fact that you've done this and created a space where people from many centers can join uh, I think is a real important thing for growing our specialties presence in this field. Um, so as Matt mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking about preoperative cardiac risk assessment, specifically in the setting of non-cardiac surgery. And I'm going to talk about three relatively more simple things that we can do. Uh, so scoring systems, by that I mean really clinical risk indices. Uh, and I'll also mention briefly, since there's an area where I've done a bit of work, the role of functional capacity assessment to inform clinical risk assessment. Uh, but spent a bit of time, quite a bit of time to, uh, speaking about the emerging role of cardiac biomarkers, specifically uh, natriuretic peptides, as well as troponins to better inform our understanding of perioperative risk. Uh, these are my disclosures, none of which I think are relevant to the topic of this presentation. I also want to acknowledge the sources of support that support my time outside the operating room, as well as support my research program. So this is what I want to cover in this presentation. I'm going to first start off talking about clinical risk indices or scoring systems, speak about their potential advantages, but important limitations that make us think about supplementing that risk information with other approaches, specifically functional capacity, which is what we'll talk about next, and finally finish off with an in-depth discussion about troponins and natriuretic peptides and how they can, in some cases, better uh, allow us to estimate somebody's risk for major cardiovascular events after surgery. So let's talk about what we can do at the bedside using readily available clinical information that we can have available to us, a history, a physical examination, readily available laboratory tests, which is clinical information that can be incorporated into some form of clinical risk index. There are a number of clinical risk indices that are recommended by guidelines, be it you know, the relatively old 2014 AHA guidelines, which I understand will be revised hopefully by next year or sometime after, uh, the Canadian guidelines that uh, Matt mentioned, and most recently, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines that were published about a month ago. Um, so I'll speak about the first about the index that I use probably the most myself, uh, and with, that's the Revised Cardiac Risk Index. And you know, one of the reasons I use this is because it's relatively a simple index uh, to use in clinical practice. It's an older index, index. it's the latest iteration of what began as the Goldman Index and subsequently the Detsky Index and now the Lee Index. Uh, based on data from the 1990s, this paper was actually published in 1999. And one of the reasons why it's used a fair bit is that it's relatively simple. There are six components, five of which are comorbidities, 
one of which is some classification for high-risk surgery, which is relatively simple. Uh, it's anything that's intraperitoneal, intrathoracic, or superangular vascular. You simply assign a point for each. The more points you have, the higher your risk. Uh, and if we look at the risk of major cardiovascular events in risk strata defined by the RCRI, that has actually changed over time, partially because surgery has changed, but most importantly, the way we detect cardiovascular events after surgery has changed. At the time this index was developed, they actually used CKMV for a component of the cardiac risk detection, first generation troponins. We typically use fourth or fifth generation troponins at many centers. So what are the event rates for, let's say, cardiac death myocardial infarction or non-fatal cardiac arrest in those risk strata. These are probably the most contemporary generalizable data that we have using contemporary assays. And this was from a subset analysis of elective surgery because the RCRI was designed for elective surgery. Uh, and this was published by Roshanov and colleagues in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology last year. The overall event rate in that sample was about 3.3% which is actually what you would expect if you systematically looked for myocardial infarction in major inpatient non-cardiac surgery. So if you had no risk factors, interestingly, the event rate was about 1.6%. It's not that low, but it's certainly about half of what the average rate was for that particular sample. If you had one risk factor, it was essentially average for that sample. And you had you know, risks of eight to 13% when you have more risk factors. Um, so it does classify patients into groups of differing risk. If you look at the ability of the RCRI to discriminate, so separate people into groups with different risks for major outcomes, it's modest. So if you use it, if you measure it using what's called an area under the receiver operating curve or AUC, that value across most validation studies is about 0.7, which is okay. It's not great. It's not terrible. It's okay. Uh, but I think one of the other important limitations to keep in mind, and you would have seen this in clinical practice, is you apply the RSRI and they have one clinical risk factor and you're wondering, well, what do I do with this? Because, you know, the, average, the risk that you get with that is about average for your sample. They're neither very low risk, but they're also not very high risk. And what has been shown in many studies is that a significant proportion of patients, when you apply the RSRI, end up in that indeterminate intermediate risk group, maybe a third, maybe 50%. At the end of this clinical risk classification, you're wondering, well, what do I do with this information? And for that reason, uh, and there have been other clinical risk indices that have been developed, some of which are recommended by guidelines. And I'll speak about two that are recommended by guidelines. So the first is what's called the Gupta Index, the cardiac risk calculator. This was published in circulation back in 2011. And for those of you who are, haven't looked at the methodology, this was developed using the NISC WIP registry. Uh, and for predicting myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest, it consists of five components uh, with a much more granular definition of uh, sort of classification scheme for surgical procedure. It wasn't simply the binary approach that you see in the RCRI. Uh, and certainly when you looked at its ability to discriminate in that original sample, as well as subsequent validation studies in the NISQIP registry, it's pretty good, it's 0.87. It's certainly consistently above the RCRI in those data sets. Something that's emerged more recently and is also recommended in the most European guidelines is uh, what's called the CVRI, which was developed initially from the American University of Beirut, subsequently validated uh, in the NISQIP registry, it approaches it uh, similar to what you see in the RCRI. There are six components, all of which are assigned equal weights. The more points that you have, the higher your risk. And certainly in the validation data set, which was again the NISQIP registry, uh, it had pretty good discrimination, certainly above what you see with the RCRI. So people do use these indices, uh, certainly the risk calculator, there are a lot of online calculators that allow you to apply that. What are some things you should bear in mind when using the risk scoring systems? And I think both of them have an issue, I think that largely relates, certainly in my view, and one of the reasons why I don't use it that much, with the way outcomes were measured in the original data sets that were used to develop these risk indices. And as a consequence of some of those limitations, what are issues with what are termed calibration? And what I mean by that is when this risk index tells you this patient's event rate as far as cardiac death or MI is X percentage, it is highly likely that their true risk is different than that. It can tell you that one patient is higher risk than another, but in terms of telling you what the actual event rate, uh, and that's often what we use for clinical decision making, that estimate may be somewhat inaccurate. And I'll give you some indications of why that might be the case. So if you look at the original Gupta paper, uh, it's interesting that their rate of myocardial infarction or 
cardiac arrest was 0.65%, which I would argue is pretty low. Not only that, if you look in the postoperative period, there were actually more postoperative cardiac arrests than postoperative myocardial infarctions. And I think most of us agree that that doesn't actually agree with our clinical experience. And one of the reasons for that is that there's no systematic surveillance for myocardial infarction in the MISCRIP registry, and is likely that there was significant underdetection of myocardial infarction. So when the MICA calculator gives you an event rate of, let's say, 2%, I would argue that the true risk is probably considerably higher than that. And sometimes we make decisions based on what that true risk is. The same sort of issue applies with the Gupta, with the CVRI. And this is a sort of a validation study where that CVRI was applied again in the NISGRIP registry. The outcome of interest there was death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. This was a large sample using, again, the NISGRIP registry. And what you see when you go from no risk factors to three or more risk factors, the event rate goes up from 0.3% to 17.5. What is notable, though, is that the dominant event in the composite is actually death. In each one of these subclasses, there are almost three to four times as many deaths as there are myocardial infarctions, which again, doesn't quite jive with clinical reality. If anything, this is really a risk index that predicts death, certainly, uh, as opposed to myocardial infarction. Um, and again, uh, that relates to the fact that it, there was no systematic surveillance for myocardial infarction in the original data sets that were used to develop the CVRI and subsequently validate it, which means that the predicted event rates that you get from these calculators are likely somewhat of an underestimate. And that's really an important thing that you to bear in mind when you use these risk calculators. So when we think about scoring systems, what can we say are some advantages? Well, they have at least moderate accuracy. I think that's fair to say in terms of discrimination. They're relatively quick to use at the bedside. And they're essentially zero cost, like there are no additional costs, certainly with taking a history or using readily available lab tests. What are some of the problems? Well, some of the risk stratification results in some lack of clarity. So in the RCRI, you would end up with a lot of people in the intermediate risk group. Uh, in the case of the CVRI and Gupta risk calculators, you're not sure if the predicted event rate from these calculators actually matches with their true event rate. So if they say it's a 2% rate of myocardial infarction or death, it is entirely possible that the true event rate is 5 or 6%. You just don't know because of the lack of calibration. And the last is diagnostic uncertainty. So these are all will tell you that a patient may be very high risk based on, let's say, a RCRI of 3 or 4, but it doesn't tell you why they're high risk. And in many ways, our risk mitigation strategies, both during the OR and afterwards, are dependent not only on whether a patient is high risk, but why they are. So is it because of cerebrovascular disease? Is it because they have bad heart failure? Is it because of significant coronary artery disease? You want to know what the reason is for their risk if you're going to modify their care accordingly. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's certainly an impetus for additional risk stratification methods in clinical practice. But I would make the argument, and I think that's a really important point to consider in all risk stratification uh, approaches in surgery, is it matters only if additional risk information is useful. So in some cases, you know the patient's high risk. They've got a RCR of three or four, they're undergoing major vascular surgery, they need the operation. I would argue in most circumstances, knowing what their bi cardiac biomarkers are or knowing what their functional capacity might be is probably not that useful because you already know they're very high risk. You really need to deal with the patient at hand. So I think it's important to ask, when you move beyond clinical risk and disease and consider other approaches, how useful is that information going to be for decision-making, for informing the patient? Because it's only if it's useful that you should consider some of the supplemental methods that we'll discuss now. So what are some of those supplemental methods? I'm going to talk about cardiac biomarkers, but I think there's no point talking about it unless we at least mention briefly functional capacity, because that is emphasized at least in two guidelines, certainly the AHA guidelines, and certainly the most recent 2022 European guidelines, where functional capacity assessment still plays a major role in their risk stratification approaches. Now, by functional capacity, I'm talking about estimated functional capacity, because I think most of us would agree that outside, let's say the UK, especially England, most of us do not do standardized exercise testing on most of our patients. It's simply not practical. We wouldn't ever have enough CPED or exercise testing resources to offer this test to most of our patients. So what we do is on the basis of our patient interview, ask patients questions about their physical activity levels. Based on their responses, we make an inference 
about what we think their exercise capacity might have been if they actually underwent CPET or they performed a standardized exercise test. So we might ask them about the ability to walk, climb stairs, what household activities they did, what kinds of exercise, if any, they performed, and we make a judgment based on that. But our typical patient interview is what I would call unstructured. By unstructured, it means that some of us may ask for questions, some of us may ask to, and there are those amongst of us who will simply ask about climbing stairs. And that variation may even exist in our own practice, depending on whether you're tired at the end of a busy day in clinic or whether it's nine o'clock in the morning and you got a lot of, you've just had coffee and you're ready to go. Uh, and that variability and at times reliance on a few items results in a couple problems. So when you rely on a few data points, we're considerably more in, in sort of affected by respondents' self-reporting biases. So many people are not exactly objective about their level of physical activity. They'll tell you they climb stairs, but they won't tell you that they could do it only a month ago, that they'd have you know, stopped three or four times from climbing. Um, we're often more optimistic about our physical activity levels than reality. And the variability in the questions asked amongst anesthesia providers and within our own practice means this is a relatively noisy thermometer. It's not a great way to gauge exercise capacity if you're doing it in an unstructured fashion. And so if something is unstructured, it is potentially unreliable, it probably follows that it is not the greatest measure of objectively measured exercise capacity. And that's been borne out by the data. These are data from the MET study, uh, where amongst other things, we took 1,400 patients, we asked anesthesiologists to conduct their usual preoperative interview, and on the basis of their usual interview, make a judgment about what their patient's fitness might be. So less than four METs, four to 10 METs, or greater than 10 METs, compared that to objectively measured exercise capacity. We found that in general, anesthesiologists had some sense that some patients were fitter than others, but our classification was quite imprecise. Certainly, if you looked at the ability of our judgment to identify patients with poor fitness, so less than four METs, it only had about 20% sensitivity. It just wasn't very good. So if you have a thermometer or a measurement technique that's unreliable, it follows that it probably tends not to predict outcomes well. And that's certainly what's been borne out in the data thus far and is emerging. In the MET study, we found that anesthesiologist judgment about exercise capacity did not predict myocardial infarction, it didn't predict myocardial injury, and it did not predict major complications. And that was consistent with some other large single center studies. This is an older study by Wickland and colleagues published back in 2001, about 6,000 patients at a single center in the United States. Anesthesiologists rated patients' fitness in METs, and they compared the ability of estimated METs to predict either cardiac complications or death. It was pretty poor in predicting cardiac complications, an AUC of 0.66, it was next to useless for predicting death. It was also shown in the study by Marsman and colleagues from the Netherlands, from Utrecht, where they looked at the ability of anesthesiologists' subjective judgment uh, that a patient's METS was less than four to improve cardiac risk estimation on top of clinical risk factors, and they found that there was no additive value for cardiac risk estimation. Now, importantly, all of these involved anesthesiologists simply doing whatever they did, normally in their interview methods, and on that basis, make an estimate about somebody's exercise capacity. So can we make our interview approach better? And I would argue there's at least the potential that we can. And that approach is to move from the unstructured approach that we normally apply to something that is more standardized and consistent. So as opposed to asking a number of highly variable questions, that we stick with a specific standard number of items that we always ask all patients. Now that could simply mean we ask standardized questions all the time about climbing stairs or walking, or we can also apply validated multi-item questionnaires, the Duke Activity Status Index questionnaire, or DASI being one example, that have been demonstrated as showing correlation with objectively measured exercise capacity. That approach does result in a, the thermometer that we use to measure exercise capacity in being a little bit more precise because there's consistency. We're still affected by respondents' self-reporting biases, but I would argue that especially when you ask more questions, if you ask something more than simply climbing stairs, you have an increase in the number of items that contribute data, and potentially you are less affected by self-reporting bias because maybe patients may be overly optimistic about climbing stairs, but if they told you, by the way, I can't really mow the lawn or carry groceries in the house, that will probably tell you, well, maybe there's some inferences that you can make about what their true exercise capacity might be. 
So how can structured assessment perform, structured assessment perform in estimating cardiac risk? Uh, well, if you look at simple questions, do res patients' responses to simple questions about something like climbing stairs, are they valid measures of exercise capacity? And it appears that they are. So this is a single center study from Europe, 140 patients. These are not surgical patients. Um, but patients were asked to report the number of flights of stairs they could climb, they believed, with, before they had to stop. And they compared that against performance on objective exercise testing on the y-axis. And you can see as patients reported that they could climb more flights of stairs before they have to stop, in general, the exercise capacity appeared to increase. And essentially, once you had patients who reported that they could climb at least two flights of stairs before stopping, the vast majority of them obtained more than four METs on formal exercise testing. Now, do simple questions like that predict outcomes? Perhaps, but there's some limitations with the data. So this is a relatively old study by Riley and colleagues published in Archives of Internal Medicine, which is what JAMA Internal Medicine used to be about two decades ago. And they simply took 600 patients who were presenting at an outpatient uh, preoperative clinic. So this was all elective surgery. The mean age was 63. And they asked them, can you climb two flights of stairs and walk four blocks on level ground? And if a patient said they couldn't, their unadjusted relative risk for cardiac events was about 1.85. It was relatively imprecise if you looked at the confidence limits, but it was certainly elevated in those patients. Again, modest size, single center study. This is a larger study from Basel in Switzerland. This was a secondary analysis of the Basel PMI study led by uh, both uh, Christian Pulacker and Giovanna Lorati Booz, uh, which principally focused on the patterns and epidemiology of postoperative myocardial injury. But they were able to link those data on postoperative cardiac events to the hospital information, electronic information system that, amongst other things, reported whether patients were capable, reported that they could climb two flights of stairs or more without stopping. And so if you had this binary question, can you climb two flights of stairs? Can that predict cardiac outcomes? They looked at this in sample of about 4,500 patients. This was an older group of patients and about a third of them were having emergency surgery. And I think that's an important thing to consider because when you look at emergency surgery, the one question I always wonder is somebody tells you they can't climb stairs. Is it because they really can't climb stairs or are they really attributing to the fact that they came in with an acute abdomen? So obviously they can't quite, they can climb a flight of stairs. So ability to estimate functional capacity in emergency urgent surgery is a little bit more challenging. That being said, in that study, the unadjusted hazard ratio for cardiac events, which is myocardial infarction or cardiac death, was significantly higher. The hazard ratio was 1.63, and uh, it, was rel it was highly statistically significant. So there's at least some limited data suggesting that simply asking about climbing stairs or walking, but in a standardized fashion, might be helpful. What about standardized questionnaires? I mentioned this. So the one that's probably been studied the most in the perioperative literature is the Duke Activity Statics Index Questionnaire. Many of you are familiar with it. It's 12 items, yes or no questions, developed originally for assessing exercise capacity in outpatient cardiology patients. And if you say yes to a question, it's assigned a weight. It goes from 0 to 48.2, so not exactly the most easy scoring system. But it has been demonstrated consistently as being at least moderately correlated with objectively measured exercise capacity. Uh, what are some things you need to consider with that? Some of the items in this questionnaire are a bit uncomfortable for patients to respond to. So item number 10 is often missing if, uh, if you give somebody a paper questionnaire uh, because they don't want to talk about sexual relations. They're not sure why you're being asked this when they're having, I don't know, their shoulder done, let's say. It doesn't seem quite related when they're being asked that question. Some of the questions have some you know, issues with cultural adaptability. So if you ask patients about the ability to play doubles, tennis, or ski, that may not be the most applicable question in some geographic settings. There's some complexity to the scoring system. And lately, uh, there's this DASI question is interestingly, after being free for a long time, has been licensed. And so in some areas, if you integrate this into your hospital EMR, there may be costs with using this, so it is no longer zero cost. That being said, Certainly in the MET study, we looked in the secondary analysis of the ability of the DASI score to predict cardiovascular outcomes. And we found that when the DASI score was less than 34, where lower DASI scores indicate lower levels of fitness, um, patients experienced an elevated risk of major complications as well as myocardial infarction. 
And that magnitude of that risk seemed to be clinically relevant when you had a DASI score of about 25 or less, by which time your odds ratio was about 1.5 or higher. But as you can see, these confidence limits are pretty wide. And one of the reasons for that very simply is that uh, it's a, a limitation that we acknowledge in the MET cohort data. We only had 26 deaths or myocardial infarction events. So we didn't have the world's most robust data set for being able to determine for sure that the DASI can predict myocardial infarction or death, there's still a need to validate this better. And that's certainly some of the ongoing work that our own group is completing, and I'm sure others are as well. Are there other questionnaires you can consider? I think this is something that you may see in the literature in the next few months, and that's the MET repair questionnaire. This was designed for a large European study called the MET repair question, uh, study led by Giovanna Lurati Boos, who was actually originally in Basel. She's now in Dusseldorf. And their intent was to establish whether a standardized questionnaire to, to measure exercise capacity, whether that could predict cardiac events. They tried the DASI questionnaire in the European setting, and they found very simply that it didn't work well for many countries in the European setting. They thought that they should develop a new questionnaire, and that's what they did. This is what the MET repair questionnaire is. It's a bit different. It's, simply, it's somewhat more of what I would call an ordinal scale that's available in many different translations, because this was used across Europe from Western, Northern, Central, as well as Southern Europe. Uh, and what it does is create categories with act levels of activity with similar estimated uh, sort of exercise requirements. So eight METs, maybe three METs, maybe six METs. And patients are simply asked, can you perform any one of these activities, yes or no? And so of course they will mark yes or no to each one of these categories. You'll simply identify the category with the highest associated level of METs. Uh, that a patient reports as being able to complete, and that's their exercise capacity. So it's a bit different than what you see with the DASI score. It's ordinal as opposed to an additive scale, relatively easy to uh, implement. And certainly their experience in Europe was that this could be used in many settings uh, with a bit more ease than the DASI score. Uh, is it a valid measure of exercise capacity? There is some evidence, much less than with the DASI score, showing that the MET repair questionnaire here on the x-axis has at least moderate correlation with performance on exercise testing. And that study that was published also gave us a bit of a translation from what a DASI score might be to a MET repair score. So certainly that study would suggest that a DASI score of 25 or less corresponds to about less than five METs on MET repair. Though I think, again, we need more validation data to understand that. The key question, of course, is does it predict outcomes? Uh, we know that, that that study has been completed. It's currently in the review process. And I hope that we will see this in the peer-reviewed literature, certainly within the next two to three months, uh, because I think it'll help us a lot in understanding whether estimated functional capacity can inform cardiac risk assessment and how well it can do so. So when you think about functional capacity, I've talked a little bit about it. It is a supplement to clinical risk scores, which are, again, relatively rapid and essentially zero cost, much such as scoring systems. But there's some unclear accuracy about these scoring systems. Um, and especially if your result, you know, you rely on simple questions such as climbing stairs. Many of us have met patients who say, well, I can't climb stairs because of arthritis, because of a variety of reasons. What do you do with those patients? So not only is there a lack of accuracy, sometimes you simply can't implement those questions. And that's related to the question of how best you should measure estimated functional capacity. Is it a questionnaire? Is it a standardized questionnaire? Uh, standardized questions. We don't quite know that. And as I mentioned, even though we have promising approaches, such as standardized questions about climbing stairs, such as a standardized questionnaire, we do need robust data to better understand the role of estimated functional capacity. So we still, in many cases, need to consider additional risk stratification methods beyond scoring systems, beyond functional capacity. Um, and again, as I mentioned, when we think about something like cardiobark markers, it's really only if the additional risk information is useful. So that's really why we think about cardiac biomarkers. And it's important to think about the context when we think about the role for cardiac biomarkers in risk assessment. So I'm gonna talk about the two things for which there's evidence and which are certainly mentioned in guidelines, both uh, certainly to some extent in the older AHA guidelines to a large extent in the Canadian guidelines with natriuretic peptides and in the most recent European guidelines for natriuretic peptides and troponins are emphasized. So we'll talk a little bit about natriuretic peptides. So we all know this, it's BNP or anti-pro-BNP. It's called brain natriuretic peptide because it was first isolated in the brain, 
But where we really think about it is, in, of course, the heart. Uh, and it's secreted by the heart in response to anything that makes the walls of the heart work harder, from myocardial stretch to pressure overload to ischemia. There are two components that are released into the bloodstream, NT pro BNP and BNP. Uh, NT pro BNP is somewhat of the more expensive, more expensive assay, but it has a number of advantages. Uh, you can simply collect it at room temperature in an EDTA tube. Uh, it has a longer half-life, so it's less affected by acute changes, acute changes in patients' loading conditions, such as you know whether they've been fasting or whether you gave them a fluid bolus just recently. So NT pro BNP certainly has some convenience features. BNP is often cheaper. The half-life is shorter, so it's affected by short-term loading conditions a little bit more. And there's some convenience issues. So at mill centers, if you measure BNP, you have to collect it and put it on ice before you send it off to the lab because the results are not stable unless it's on ice. We know that natriuretic peptides have a major role in clinical practice outside the perioperative setting. And as most of us would be aware, it has a major role in heart failure. Uh, and its role there is well established both for diagnosis of acute suspected heart failure in the clinical setting, if somebody has significant dyspnea, it helps you establish whether it's heart failure or something else. It establishes prognosis in acute and chronic heart failure. And to some extent, it can help guide response to therapy in heart failure, though the randomized control data, from my understanding on whether BNP or NT pro BNP response really improves outcomes in heart failure therapy is still open to question. That's where it's well established. But there are reasonably robust data, but some very large studies showing the relationship between preoperative natriuretic peptide levels and the risk of major outcomes, cardiac outcomes after non-cardiac surgery. So this includes a individual patient meta-analysis published back in 2014 by Rotset and colleagues, which include a number of individual different studies where they pooled together individual data. It considered NT pro BNP, but also BNP. This was a secondary analysis of a randomized control trial led by Peter Nagali, who's an anesthesiologist based at the University of Chicago, which looked at the ability of NT pro BMP, amongst other things, to predict outcomes. And the most large and robust study, of course, is the one by Emmanuel Duceppe, which was a subset of the large vision cohort study, which looked at the ability of NT pro BMP to predict cardiovascular outcomes. Very large studies. And importantly, every one of these studies showed that preoperative natriuretic peptides were associated with elevated risks of postoperative cardiac outcomes, but also consistently showed that addition of natriuretic peptide information to clinical risk information, such as demographics, such as simple clinical risk factors, consistently improved prediction of cardiovascular events. So not only was it associated with cardiac events, it did better than clinical risk factors. How can you interpret this information? So if you're looking at BNP and you happen to use it at your center, probably the most robust data comes from the individual meta patient meta-analysis from Rodzik and colleagues, you want to consider what the average event rate in that sample was. It was 11%. So it's pretty high risk and it's a high risk sample. And importantly, some of those events, which were described as myocardial infarction, if you look at the methods, were actual myocardial injury episodes. So there's a reason why those, those were not simply myocardial infarctions, they were simply elevated troponin. So that's a thing to bear in mind. But the average event rate was 11%. If you had a BNP level less than 100, you had an event risk that was 5%. So certainly at least half of what was average, that's a pretty significant decrease in risk. If it was about 100 to 250, it was indeterminate, it was about the average. Uh, but if your BNP level was greater than 250, it was much, much higher. It was elevated by about two and a half to three fold. We have much more robust data for anti-pro-BMP. Uh, and there in the study by Emmanuel Deceppe and colleagues where the average event rate for myocardial infarction, cardiac death or non-fatal cardiac arrest was 4%. The low risk category appeared to be anti-pro-BMP less than 100. There your event rate was 2% as opposed to 4% being average. It was a significant decrease in risk. Uh, if it was 100 to 200, it was indeterminate. And the moment it was greater than 200, that risk appeared to increase in a stepwise fashion. The threshold certainly for identifying low risk patients uh, appears less than 100, about 92, if you look at the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines. And based on the data from Emmanuel Duceppe's study, it should probably be an NT pro BMP less than 100. What's important to remember is where NT pro BMP really works well is in identifying low risk patients. If your BMP or NT pro BMP is less than these thresholds, their patient is at very, very low risk for poor outcomes. The high values are a little bit more challenging to interpret. 
Um, what are the other advantages of these tests? And this has been shown when you incorporate this with information, let's say from the RCRI, as I mentioned, when you look at the RCRI, a lot of patients end up in that indeterminate risk group where you're not sure, well, what do I do with this patient who has one RCRI risk factor? When you add information from natriuretic peptides, you can considerably decrease the size of that group from about half of your patients to about 25%. So you're able to allocate more of those patients who are either low-risk patients that you don't have to worry about or high-risk patients where, frankly, you should care a little bit more. What are some considerations then with natriuretic peptides? Well, here are the advantages. It's definitely accurate in terms of risk stratification. It is fast. Some of these tests are, can be performed at the bedside or the results available in a relatively short period of time. And it is, I wouldn't say it was, it's not free, but it is relatively inexpensive, let's say, compared to sending somebody for a stress test. What are some of the downsides? Oh, so one other thing I should mention is that this also provides information that is unrelated to functional capacity. So sometimes people think, well, if I can't measure functional capacity, uh, I should just measure BNP, or I can use functional capacity to determine if I should measure BNP. But in truth, the correlation between objectively measured exercise capacity and natriuretic peptides in surgical patients is relatively poor. So this means that this provides risk information that is probably only partially related, if anything, to functional capacity. So that's an advantage. It tells you this can provide more information than simply functional capacity alone. Uh, the downsides, of course, is most times we're thinking about estimating risk for ischemic events after surgery, but this is actually a biomarker for heart failure. So it's interesting that we're using a heart failure biomarker to predict ischemic outcomes. Does that make sense? As I mentioned, the easiest situation with natriuretic peptides is when the level is low, because you don't have to worry about a patient, what if it's high? What do we do? Does it mean we simply go forward with surgery? Do we have to cancel surgery? Do they need an echo? Do they need a stress test? Uh, the Canadian cardiovascular guidelines simply say we should do troponins in those patients postoperatively, but not modify anything more. And I think that's one of the lack of clarity that I think is something that we have to figure out better about what to do with this information. How is this information actionable if the levels are elevated? And finally, there's diagnostic uncertainty. An elevated natriuretic peptide tells you a patient is at high risk. We should be sure of that. It does not always tell you why they are at high risk. So there are a number of important things that can cause an elevated in natriuretic peptides that is prognostically important, and you got to figure that out. So it could be myocardial ischemia, it could be heart failure, but it could be atrial fibrillation. Uh, obesity actually does the opposite. There's some arguments that it, it actually decreases natriuretic peptide levels, though that's a bit controversial. Patients with chronic kidney disease, with right heart disease, all of these matter, but the treatments are different. And the nitriuretic peptide level by itself does not tell you which one of these things is actually causing that elevation in NT pro BMP and potentially the increase in risk. Uh, we'll talk about then about preoperative stratification with high sensitivity troponin, which is less emphasized certainly in the North American setting. It is something you'll see a much greater emphasis in the most recent 2022 European guidelines. And actually, if you speak to European clinicians in this space, they often think about preoperative troponin a lot more than we do, uh, certainly in North America. At least that's been my experience. Let's talk a little bit about troponin. We know the troponin complex is troponin C, I, and T. Uh, we have assays that have been developed to bind to troponin I and T. Normally, those concentrations are pretty much low to undetectable. And if there's acute injury, it increases within about two to three hours after injury. But what has happened over the past decade, decade and a half, is the development of high sensitivity assays that allow us to de detect elevations in troponin concentrations that are very low, but definitely above what we call normal and would have been undetectable with first or second or third generation troponin assays. So when you think about those troponin assays, things, other things you need to think about with these assays is that when you think even of a troponin I assay and they're different manufacturers or different manufacturers for a troponin T assay, each of those assays bind to different parts of that molecule. So it means that the results are not comparable across assays. So even if you take the same blood sample and you measured high sensitivity troponin I using four different assays, you will get four different results because the assays pick up on different parts of the molecules. So you have to bear that in mind. They're not directly comparable, which also means that thresholds for troponin as being you know, a preoperative risk indicator are not comparable always across assays. Uh, because of the increased sensitivity, you know, there's a potential that the what is considered abnormal with troponin changes 
as a matter of course, simply with normal changes. So there's evidence that as time progresses and patients become older, the upper reference limit for troponin may increase, that your normal troponin for somebody who's in their 70s may be higher than somebody who's in their 40s. And there's definitely sex-specific differences and an argument by many experts in this space that you should consider sex-specific upper reference limits when trying to determine what is an abnormal troponin and when comparing men versus women who get the same test. Now, what has changed with high sensitivity assays is that if you do troponins before surgery, it is entirely conceivable that patients will have an elevation above the 99% URL before surgery. So this was shown initially in this um, sort of pilot study for the vision study, about 325 patients who underwent troponin T testing with a fifth generation assay, about one in five of them had an elevation above the 99% URL. And if you look at the 2017 vision publication in JAMA, uh, about 10, 000, where they had about 9,500 patients with preoperative troponin concentrations, about one in four had a troponin T concentration above the 99% URL before surgery. So if you do troponin testing in patients having major non-cardiac surgery, it is entirely possible that one in five will have elevation above normal before surgery. Now, at the minimum, this is useful because, you know, um, if you're going to do post-operative troponin testing, you may want to know what your baseline is to be able to interpret whether a post-operative elevation is a new elevation or simply a reflection of the baseline status for that patient. But the other thing that is evident is that patients who have elevations before surgery incur elevated risks of cardiac events after surgery, even when considering other clinical risk factors. The evidence base is not as large as what you see with antiretic peptides, but it is at least moderately strong. So there's, there's both a European study by Weber and colleagues, as well as a study, again, the secondary analysis, of the American study led by Peter Nagel. In the Weber study, what you saw was when patients were stratified based on their revised cardiac risk index with no risk factors, one risk factor, two or more, and you compared patients who had a normal troponin T concentration before surgery, as opposed to those at an elevation in each one of these risk columns, if you had a troponin T concentration above normal before surgery, your chance of having cardiac death or myocardial infarction after surgery was elevated. There was additive risk information. And if you look at the study from Peter Nagel's group, if you compared uh, troponin T, the addition of troponin T to clinical risk factors alone, you improved identification of high-risk patients, patients who would go on to have a cardiac event, as well to some degree with identification of low-risk patients. If I were to generalize, NT pro VMP does better in identifying low risk cases, whereas troponin probably does a slightly better job of identifying high risk cases, though I think we need larger head to head comparisons of the biomarkers moving forward. So, when we think about preoperative troponins, it is accurate in terms of risk stratification. The data set is not as large as NT pro VMP, but I think at least moderately compelling. It is again fast, it is relatively inexpensive. And at the minimum, if you're gonna do troponin testing after surgery, it informs interpretation of those results. The downside is what we saw with natriuretic peptides. So if it's elevated, well, what do you do with it? We're not quite, do all of those patients require a stress test? Do they require an echocardiogram? What is the next step that we should take? Uh, and there, there is again uncertainty because although we traditionally think about troponins as being associated with myocardial ischemia, when you consider simply a troponin test in an otherwise stable patient presenting for surgery, there's a number of other things that could cause troponin elevation. It could indeed be low-grade ischemia, but it could be heart failure. It could be atrial fibrillation, it could be poor renal function, it could be right heart disease, it could be tachycardia in some cases as well. All of those might be prognostically important in surgical patients. And the way we use that risk information to inform our clinical practice depends on what's causing it. And so the risk marker tells you that you should be worried, doesn't tell you why you should be worried. So I think where risk, these risk tools will probably help us move in the future is I think, and this is outside the setting of randomized trials or prospective cohort studies to date, is helping us better target complex preoperative testing. And I think we would all agree that most studies that have tried to use echoes in all patients, stress tests in all patients, or CT, CT angiography in most patients, either in all patients or identifying patients based on risk factors alone, the results have not exactly been spectacular. They've not really done a whole lot in terms of identifying patients where we had great diagnostic and prognostic yield. Maybe 
what biomarkers can help us do is identify the subsets of patients where these tests will be most informative. Um, so maybe they can target specialized tests. And I think that's where I think the direction of the growth of biomarkers will be in being able to do that. And while we need more data, if you look at the ESC guidelines, what's interesting is they're already talking about that concept even in advance of the data, because some of this is based on extrapolation from non-operative data and frankly, clinical common sense. So one of the things it tells is if a patient has an elevation of biomarkers, this is the rest stratification approach for non-cardiac surgery in either intermediate or high-risk surgery, and there's an elevation in biomarkers, one of the next things you think about is do they need an echo, potentially need stress imaging? If you look at one of the recommendations for preoperative transthoracic echo, which is pretty aggressively recommended in my view in, this, in these guidelines, one of the criteria they consider is if somebody is a high NT pro BMP before surgery, those would be the patients where you think about a pre-op echo on top of somebody who, for example, has a suspicious murmur. We do need data on this, but I think this is where the evidence base is going to grow. So I think, what can we do now? We know this evidence will, base will grow. We, I think we have a better sense of what prognostic information biomarkers can provide us. We're not sure what to do with it. What can we do for now? I think the important thing is to apply consistency in your practice. So use a consistent risk index, use a consistent measure of fitness. Um, I think all of the clinical risk indices that I've mentioned have limitations. You just have to be aware of those limitations and stick with one. If you think about assessment of fitness, I think it is reasonable to ask about stair climbing ability. We have some reasonable data for that. But if you find a patient where it simply doesn't work because they can't climb stairs for other reasons, uh, you might think about a validated questionnaire. And if you're going to use a DASI, think about a risk a score of less than 25 for identifying a high-risk patient. If you're going to use MetRepair, I think until we get the paper published uh, looking at this directly, I think less than five METs is not unreasonable. But I think if you have a patient where additional risk information may be useful, I, I think it's very reasonable to consider troponins and natriuretic peptides if that additional risk information will help you. Uh, and is there one that I would pick? I, I think we have more compelling data for natriuretic peptides, but I think both of them provide related but somewhat distinct information. Frankly, my view is if I'm thinking about a biomarker, I'll just order both. But I think the key question that we need to always ask is that these are not simply academic exercises where we sort of mindlessly follow an algorithm. At each step, if you're thinking, I'm gonna order a biomarker because I wanna get more risk information, the key question that you have to ask yourself is will that risk information really help your patient? Will they inform your patient? Will they inform your care? If it doesn't, you should just stop and just move on and let the patient have surgery or you know, use your decisions based on the readily available information. It's only when that information will be useful that those things have value. And I think that's a way that we can use some of this important new risk prediction tools to really improve the care of our patients, inform them better, and hopefully advance perioperative medicine in a meaningful way. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, boy, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I will, I've got uh, a number of questions myself, but I'll give everybody else a chance to uh, to jump in uh, if anybody wants to unmute and potentially show themselves uh, on live video and, uh, and ask a question. Well, I have a really quick question. Do you think the Blue Jays are going to do well in the playoffs? Sorry, Jen, that's a baseball thing. I know that. Had... You're asking the wrong person on that one. If I was that good at it, I would be spending fewer time, fewer hours in the OR, I suspect. And I have a different way to fund my research program. There you go. No, I mean, I had more serious questions, but I'll let see someone else go first. <laughs> Can you um, can you speak to well? I'm curious with the um, the latest Mets trial and it being uh, five. We we've always thought of four um, based on some previous research, and is that really that big a deal? Um, and so I, I'd love to hear sort of the the anytime some of these things come out and I feel like it changes the way we think about something. How specific is that? And then I, I'd be curious to hear for a lot of this, you know, we have a, what we call the high rise clinic, a high risk preoperative optimization clinic. Um, and we do our best and we've worked with some of our cardiologists in this space, Josh Beckman, who you may know, and, and have actually tried to do some of this. If someone has a BNP over X, we actually 
will cons more more likely consider an echo. So how do you practically apply some of this and what is some of your latest research? I mean, you've summarized it well, but like nitty gritty, like tomorrow in clinic, what, what do you yeah. do? You know, I, I think um, the first question about four versus five, I mean, I think Stephen will know this well, that even in the original AHA guidelines, back in the day, they were even think, there was even talk about making it six, but that would have resulted in so many stress tests, the system would have just crashed. So I think, you know, first, if we're thinking about four versus five, I think the, our estimate of functional capacity is not exactly precise in my view of whether we can differentiate that. I think it, I'm just saying with the DASI score, we know 25 seems to be where that threshold is for appreciable risk. What is it, the corresponding score, if you just translated med repair would be about five, probably about 4.5, to be honest. And that's really a very crude extrapolation. I think whenever the met repair question study is published, and I know it's in the peer review process, we will better, better sense of what that is. I suspect whatever it is, is probably, if it matters, it's going to be somewhere in that space. But importantly, I think it's not to focus on what the true METs are, because all of those, the DASI and met repair, all of them actually overestimate exercise capacity when you compare it to objectively measured exercise capacity. So four METs on, uh, is actually much higher uh, on a DASI score if you compare the patient. So I think that's, it's really to think less about what the true METs are. What does the score tell us? And I, I just think about score versus METs. What's in practical, I think that's a, you know, it's interesting because it, it is a challenge even, I was just, I was helping out in clinic today uh, and and that that's a real question. And I think what needs to happen, I mean, from a research perspective, and this is not something we're doing, but I think as we develop and people start using biomarkers more, one of the things that we need to do better in these patients is once we know somebody's elevated, we need to start doing testing in these patients in a systematic fashion and collect that information because we need to figure out is there actual yield? Like maybe we're just hypothesizing that the echoes are actually higher yield in those patients. I don't know that, but I think that is an area we've got to figure that out. And it's, it's relatively doable, especially if you're starting to do this at a high rise clinic. At our own center, there are some of us, including myself, who would order these tests if I feel it would modify management. So if somebody's having an open AAA repair, and I already know that preoperative revascularization, frankly, does very little, and I just want them to go and have their operation. I need to just give them a safe anesthetic, monitor them afterwards carefully. I'm not going to delay things. I already know, actually, if their troponin was relatively low and their BNP, I'm not going to assume they don't have ischemic heart disease because the pretest probability is pretty damn high. So I do it when I want them, when it matters to me in terms of informing judgment. And I think that's a key issue that we've got to emphasize: is will that risk information modify care? Um, and in those cases, sometimes I will order a, a troponin and, and a BMP because I can decide if they're low, I, not with 100%, but I would certainly feel more reassured that I don't have to order more specialized testing. The uncertainty is if it comes back elevated, to be honest. Uh, uh, we had a patient who was involved in a study of ours where we did NT pro BMP and troponins, and it came back, you know, the troponin was 150, the BMP was like 1500. We canceled the surgery, it was not absolutely, we brought them up, we made sure there was no acute event and they're actually undergo, gonna go undergo an elective cardiac workup. We don't know what that'll show, but I think there it made sense because we had this additional information and the patient didn't need surgery tomorrow. Uh, and we wouldn't have actually picked that information up based on our clinical examination or history. So that's, that's where it could be useful. Okay, I see uh, Steve's hand up uh, for a bit. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Amanda, for a nice presentation. A couple of comments. One is that the way that we that I recommend using BNP, and I guess you could put troponin in, I'm not sure where to put troponin these days, is when you get to what I call a gray zone in the ACC algorithm, you've gone through the risk assessment, you've gone through the exercise capacity, and now you come to the point where it says, well, I don't know if I should get a test, further testing or not. That's where I think it should be ordered as opposed to age 65 or CRI score of one or any of those things in the Canadian guidelines. The second thing is that I think when you go to that point, I don't understand why the European guidelines are pushing uh, transthoracic echoes so much. I don't know what they expect to find as opposed to a stress test or even maybe cardiac CT or something. It just didn't make sense to me that they're pushing the uh, echoes so much more than anything else. 
And the other thing I would just want to comment on your risk scores, the uh, CVRI is actually now called uh, AUV has two. And that was mentioned by the European guidelines, which had not been mentioned before because it came out afterwards. And my concern with that index, although I think it's promising, is that a lot of, they didn't have that many events and a lot of the events they had were in emergency surgery patients. I asked uh, Dr. Daykick for how it performed in purely elective surgery, because that would be more helpful. And he said it was exactly the same and they have a paper coming out soon that may show that. So maybe that'll be helpful going forward. I'd like to see it validated in other places in the United States as well. Uh, what do you think about the echo part from the Europeans? Yeah, so I, I agree with you. It's the, it's, there's a lot, if you look at the indications for pre-op echoes, there's a lot of indications for pre-op echoes in those guidelines. Why they did that, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it would be more aggressive than I think are supported by the data. I think, you know, part of it in many centers, including our own, it is faster to get an echo than it is to get a stress test. Uh, so maybe that's one of the reasons uh, that that's really, you know, was pushed a little bit more. Um, but I think I agree with you that certainly for troponins, that the more logical initial test may frankly be uh, be a stress test uh, for those patients, especially if you're worried about ischemia. For natriuretic peptides, the truth is that, you know, I, I suspect that there's a lot of heart failure in patients having surgery, diastolic, you know, HPEP and, and HREP. Uh, and some of those sort of myocardial injury episodes that we have after surgery are not so much ischemia, but frankly, heart failure. Because if you give, if patients have mild heart failure postoperatively, they will get a troponin elevation. So I think when, when you have to elevate a troponin, elevated uh, BNP before surgery, and we already know this is a heart failure marker, then I think the natural first test, frankly, is an echo in those cases, because that's your first assumption. If your anti-pro BNP is 1600, uh, that doesn't mean that you should consider a stress test in those patients if, for example, there's nothing obvious that you see on the echo. But I think, um, in general, for natriuretic peptides, if I were to summarize, I think echoes make sense more than stress tests as an initial test based on extrapolation from the related literature. Uh, I don't think stress test, uh, echoes make the first sense for, for somebody who has an elevated troponin before surgery. And I agree with you that those guidelines uh, do push echoes quite a lot. But you know, guidelines are very subjective exercises, right? I mean, there's the reasons these guidelines change, evidence has changed, but you know, if you give the same panel of experts the same data, I will say there will be some important differences between those guidelines. So I'll be curious to know when the AHA guidelines are published, uh, maybe I know they're somewhere in the writing or development process, uh, and, and the evidence base will be relatively similar to what you see for the European guidelines, what those guideline recommendations are, uh, because I think that will, again, point to the fact that there's always subjective interpretation of the data, and that's just the nature of guidelines. For sure. Anybody else? All right, well, I have one more. Um, we, uh, are you on Epic? <laughs> well, we hoped we, so yeah. It's almost, everybody. so I will say that we are in the operating room. We actually chart on paper. It is something, I know it seems very, very vintage, <laughs> to put it kindly, but eventually we will we will transition to an EMR in the OR and for the hospital. The hospital itself has has a very old uh, EMR system called Sorian. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, the short answer in the OR we don't. In the hospital we do have an EMR. It's not epic. So so my question behind that is we we've got this structured note and you know we've been using RCRI. We were actually considering going back to. NISQIP, which yeah. of course might have some of the, the MICA score Im embedded in it. And I guess to your point, it, it seems like the MICA score uh, maybe underestimates and it feels like the RCRI because when we started putting that in there, surgeons were reading our notes going, what do you mean a 13% risk of, you know, and and yet I would say in practice, I don't know that it feels like that's actually happening. So how do you put together one that feels like it may be underestimating, one that maybe feels like it's overestimating and, and find what's in the middle. Yeah, I think the problem with MICA is, and if you look at the AHA guidelines with this sort of 1% event rate, 
if you apply the RCRI, everybody's above that. Like, I mean, that's 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 highly likely, right? Uh, so I think therein lies the biggest problem with the MICA, it, that underestimate of risk. Uh, and I think that's also clouded our judgment about what is a true risk. I think if you look for infarcts in, in patients over 40 having major inpatient surgery, you should not be surprised if the numbers are like two or 3%. That's probably what you should expect. Um, so I think, you know, but that those are dominated by, of course, my non-fatal myocardial infarction. So I would say that if what really matters for decision making should be what I would call calibration. Like we need to, we make, I make decisions not knowing that one patient's risk is higher than others. It's that their revenge rate is 10% versus 5%. So I think one of the things we can't, RCRI does if we understand what its true calibration is in, in, is tell us what that is. Uh, but you know what we can also tell, and I forget if the tables show that in that Canadian Journal of Cardiology papers, is the events that contribute to that. Because yeah, there's a lot of infarcts, but there are relatively few non-fatal cardiac arrests and there are relatively fewer cardiac deaths. So I think understanding what those components contributing to that will help us get a sense of. So, if the RCRA is two, this is the event rate for myocardial infarction. This is the event rate for non infarction That may be something that's actually a bit easier to, to sort of communicate because I agree with you. If you tell somebody there are, their risk is like 6%, a surgeon will freak out because they will think that doesn't make sense. Uh, but part of it relies on the fact that we have under detection of these events, right? Because if we don't look at it, there are patients probably getting ischemic on the ward and we think it's fluid overload or we're not transfusing them or any one of those things, right? Uh, and we just don't detect it. And that doesn't mean the events don't occur. They do, we just don't know they're occurring. All right, well, you're maintaining a crowd after the hour, so that's good. Um, if no one wants to ask one, I'll, I'll ask one more because it gets, we, we quit doing troponins pre-op. We were doing pre-op and uh, BNPs and troponins actually. Um, and what we ran into was the idea of so what if they're positive? It, it, their highest risk is type two ischemia post-op. Um, am I really going to stress them? If I do, am I going to potentially do a cabbage or stent, which isn't, I won't in most people. So I, I guess um, it, what is the, and yet if someone is spilling troponin at baseline, either A, I'm not that excited. If I knew that they were already 0.0, well, in our world, I guess it'd be, you know, seven to 10 or something in your, you know, or maybe 14 to 20 in your world because um, it's because the assay we have. But I guess, does it maybe say, you know what, maybe I will put an A-line in that patient and monitor a lot more carefully? Um, or uh, I guess my question there is, do you think it can change just intra-op management? Is that okay? And in your read of things, who are the one or two very, you know, infrequent patients, but the ones that you say, actually, yeah, that's the one I would send. I think the evidence bears out that sending that patient for a stent or or other consideration is important. So I think it's a tough one because, I mean, as you know, the evidence base for pre-op revascularization is not exactly compelling. So I think the circumstance is I can defer the surgery. Like, you know, if, if that's the case, if this is not cancer surgery, we're really worried about it. Uh, where um, a meaningful discussion about the patient's risk matters for patient expectations and sort of care. So, you know, where a patient may choose to use a less aggressive approach to, like they would choose radiation as opposed to surgery, if they knew, like, I don't want to get a STEMI and have a bad, some patients, I, I, that's really understanding your patients, but I think that is a minority of cases. I think where that's more meaningful is if you're dealing with, let's say, operations that are frankly, uh, you know, could be deferred for a while, right? So we do a lot of spine surgery. <laughs> There's some open questions about the value of spine surgery, yeah. but I think, you know, let's take that aside. I think that's a real, there's an example, you know, that's much higher risk than joint surgery, which is frankly pretty low risk, even in high risk patients. Or maybe we could have some meaningful discussion about deferring surgery, doing some of these tests, because maybe they need some management for their cardiac condition beforehand. But right. outside that, I think is really interoperative care. You know, do we need to target monitoring better, informing them about patient risk? Sometimes, you know, we get these things where maybe it's hindsight, but patients will often tell, I wish somebody told me. Uh, maybe that they would maybe may be able to still proceed, but it's like the same thing I tell people who are at high risk for delirium. I say, 
you know, there's a decent chance you'd be delirious. I can't do very much about it, but just understanding that they may occur does make managing it when it occurs, especially for family members, a lot easier. And in center, in jurisdictions where we don't have ready access to monitored beds, I mean, certainly in the US, you have great access to that. That is not the case for many jurisdictions, including Canada. Uh, and sometimes having this would allow us to determine not simply A lines, but who warrants a step down bed, who warrants a setting where we can have invasive monitoring after surgery. And is this borne out by randomized trial data? No, but I think it's not unreasonable extrapolation of the data. So if somebody's troponin is high, I'm not going to revascularize them, but you know, I'm going to be more careful about looking, managing their blood pressure interoperatively. I may do troponin tests afterwards because I want to be able to not prevent events from occurring, but act rapidly as opposed to waiting till there's decompensation. And I'll put them then in a monitored setting where maybe I wouldn't have originally. Excellent. Um, wow. Well, this is uh, phenomenal. And I'm glad we have it recorded for those who weren't able to make it today. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for your time. And you, you've encouraged me to follow through with our uh, sign up mechanism so we can uh, continue to, to grow the, the group of people who are tuning in every uh, week. And for those of you who are not from Vanderbilt, uh, if you're still on uh, thanks for joining and um, just stay tuned because we have uh, more excellent speakers every week. But um, what a pleasure to have you. What a real honor. Um, so thank you so much, Dominda. Oh, my it. pleasure, Matt. Thank you so much for the invitation and really okay. enjoyed the discussion and the questions. Everybody have, have a good evening. Day.